Tonight, the Chancellor who helped save Britain's banks during the financial crisis. Alistair Darling dies at the age of 70. Tributes from across the political spectrum to the man who also led the Better Together campaign during the 2014 Scottish referendum. I'll be speaking to two of his former colleagues, the ex-number 10 spin doctor, Alistair Campbell, and the former leader of the Scottish Conservatives, Ruth Davidson. Meanwhile, at the COVID inquiry, Health Secretary Matt Hancock says government should have locked down three weeks earlier at the start of the pandemic. As hostages continue to be freed by Hamas, I've been speaking to a mother whose 21-year-old son was abducted on October the 7th. She's in the UK to campaign for his release. And it's that time of the year again. We will have our very own festive switch on. All that and more with Nimco Ali and Sonia Soda, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Thursday. I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is the Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Elsa Darling once told me a story about himself. He was outside his house doing a bit of gardening, pulling out some weeds or whatever, when a reporter from a newspaper showed up. The reporter took one look at the guy kneeling in the soil and thought, oh, that must be the gardener. So he asked him if Alistair Darling was in. Oh, no, he's, he's not here at the minute. Sorry, replied Alistair Darling. Now, I, I like that story, firstly, because it's quite funny. But secondly, and most importantly, because I think it gives you a sense of who Alistair Darling was, unassuming, humble. Westminster is full of politicians and, if I'm honest, probably journalists as well, who make themselves seem bigger than they actually are. But Alistair Darling was that rare politician who really was the opposite. Here's our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. Apologies, we'll bring you that Sam Coates piece as soon as we can. Uh, but in the meantime, let's hear from Ruth Davidson. She's a former Scottish Conservative leader. She worked with Alistair Darling in the campaign against Scottish independence in 2014. I spoke to her a bit earlier. Talk us through how you knew Alistair. Well, I kind of knew Alistair in, in two phases, really. So I was a, a journalist here in Scotland for 10 years before uh, I went into politics. So I interviewed him many times when he was the Secretary of State for Scotland, when he was the Secretary of State for Transport uh, and other jobs uh, within government. And then when I got elected and I became leader of the Scottish Conservative Party, I worked with him on the Better Together campaign, which he led, which was the campaign to keep Scotland within the United Kingdom. Uh, and I got to know him in that sort of 18 months to two year period. Um, I, I think pretty well. And my regard for him could not have been higher. He was just the most solid sort of person that you could uh, possibly hope to work with or for. Um, uh, and, you know, there is not a single person that works in the Better Together campaign that has a bad word to say about Alistair because he absorbed so much pressure and let us do our roles within that campaign. Uh, and he was just the lightning rod for everything that was thrown at us. Um, Oftentimes when people die, you say that they were a great man and it sounds a bit twee. In, in this case, as unassuming as he was, uh, you know, Scotland has lost a, a very good servant today. It's interesting you say that he absorbed the pressure uh, in that campaign. I mean, many people would say that he did that throughout his career, particularly during the financial crash as well. What, what kind of politician do you think he was? Well, actually, it's interesting that you mentioned the financial crash. So years after the Indy Ref, um, I interviewed Christine Lagarde when she was the head of the IMF, and she was the finance minister in France at the time uh, of, of the financial crash and, and, and when he was the Chancellor of the Exchequer, and they worked very closely together. In fact, all of the finance ministers of the G7 did to try and you know stop you know everything from collapsing around the world. And uh, um, I, was, I wasn't interviewing her about her role with anybody else, but she took, you know, she was at great pains to tell me what a fantastic... Um, sort of collaborator he was. And actually the pressure that she said, it wasn't about how good an economist you were or how, how financially adept you were at the time. For all of these finance ministers who were making decisions, it was that ability. It was about character. It was about how you could make decisions under pressure. And you had to operate and make clear-sighted decisions all through the day, all through the night, all through the next day, all through the next night, because they didn't sleep for days. Uh, and she was at pains to tell me, and she knew that I was from a different political party, and she was like, you know, I don't know what you think of him, but all I can say is 
he's the sort of person that you want. He was all character. He was so good under pressure. He just kept operating. He kept going. Uh, and to have somebody of, of that kind of stature talking completely unprompted about that while somebody's alive and not just doing the the kind of kind words once they, they die thing, it, it, it really struck me. And everything that she said completely chimed with everything that I'd seen when we were in the middle of that that campaign to keep the United Kingdom together. And, and Alistair gave so much of himself and it was... It was a real slog. I mean, it was 18 months, two years of a, a full-time campaign where it wasn't just the British press that were looking at us. You know, there was media calls every day from every country in the world. It was it was enormous. And and he just quietly got on with the job. And, and you know, the respect I had for him because of the amount of care that he showed for everybody that works for him and with him, uh, you know, he's just a really decent soul. Ruth Davidson speaking about her memories of Alistair Darling there. Let's now listen to that Sam Coates piece that we mentioned earlier. A run on a major bank at home. The global financial system on the brink. Alistair Darling, the man many believe prevented total collapse. As Gordon Brown's Chancellor, he was at the heart of the efforts to save the country's banking system. We were faced with really unprecedented pressures uh, in, recent, in recent years. Told that RBS was just hours away from running out of money, he intervened with taxpayer help. A decade later, the mild-mannered Scott reflected on the scale of the crisis he faced. If the RBS had gone down, it would have brought down every other British bank, probably the American banking system and Europe as well, and there's no way we could have that. His relationship with the Prime Minister was occasionally stormy. His frank warning that the country faced its worst downturn in 60 years infuriated Number 10 and provoked a fierce backlash that he never forgot. The forces of hell were unleashed. Uh, not, by, not, by, by Number 10? I tell you, not just then, the, the Tories as well. The Tories, you know, jumped onto the bandwagon as ever and they all tried to join in. And, of course, it's difficult, but, you know, you, know, you just have to, especially as a Chancellor, if you're in politics, uh, if you have to be thick-skinned. Despite those troubles, Gordon Brown cleared just how vital the former Chancellor was. In times of crisis, Alistair was the person you would want in the room because he's, he was calm, he was considered, he had great wisdom, he had a strong uh, sense of what was right and wrong, he had great integrity, he was a person you could rely and depend upon. The second act of his political life, saving the union of the United Kingdom, chair of the pro-union campaign in the Scottish independence referendum. So as proud Scots who want a better future for Scotland, let's be confident in saying, yes, we are better together. Thank you very much. The love and affection heard in tributes today, rare for a politician of his rank. Prizing unity, practising modesty, traits less seen around here these days. Sam Coates, Sky News, Westminster. Well, Alistair Campbell was the Director of Communications for Tony Blair in Downing Street. He, of course, worked with Alistair Darling in government. Thank you very much for being on the programme. How will you remember Alistair Darling? I remember him for lots of reasons, but I think in terms of his contribution to the period of politics and government I was involved in as the ultimate team player, as somebody who wasn't in it for himself, who was somebody absolutely committed to public service and who was, who was brilliant at everything he did. Uh, and he was a lovely, lovely, lovely man to work with. Do you have any particular memories of him that you want to share? There was one that actually I, 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 I did a few earlier with somebody who reminded me of. I'd completely forgotten about this, but it's, it's in one of the diaries I wrote. And that was when the Queen Mother died. And Alistair who was as proper as they come. And Alistair telephoned me from a rare holiday and said, look, I've got a bit of a problem here. I said, well, I said, well, I haven't got a black tie and I'm worried that if I go out, somebody might spot me and think that I'm being very, very disrespectful to the Queen Mother. And it was classic Alistair. One, that he was worrying about that when he was on holiday a long way from home. But secondly, that his instinct was as it were, to do what he saw as the right thing. Now, I think I was able to assure him that the idea of it becoming a huge scandal that he was spotted going for a walk on the beach with his family would kind of was perhaps over the top. 
And I think the other the other memories of him were during the Scottish referendum, when he played a very significant leadership role. And I think if you hear from people like Alex Salmon today, who was obviously on the other side of the argument, I think the great thing about Alistair is that the same person that you saw in public life was had that same integrity in everything he did, that he did outside. And so we have some great chats up there, and also the fact that he was under massive pressure, could get pressured, could sometimes find the pressures very, very difficult, but in all of his public face would be calm, would be measured. And I think those, they were the qualities that enabled him to be such a huge figure and such a great support to Gordon Brown when the, uh, the financial crisis struck. I don't know if you agree with this, but one of my kind of reflections on Alistair Darling is that he was quite unlike many other politicians and also, to be frank, journalists here in Westminster, mm. and that he didn't really seem to have a big ego at all. No. I, I can't... I've been trying to think through the day. I can't ever remember Alistair trying to sort of get preferment for himself. I can't ever remember him... <clears throat> excuse me, I can't ever remember him saying, you know, what's going to happen in the reshuffle then? I can't ever remember him trying to get favour for what he did. He just did the job. Um, and I think, actually, he, he, he... I think he underestimated how strong he was as a politician. I think he sometimes underestimated how good he was as a politician. I think he saw himself as a, as a kind of middle-of-the-road, middle-ranking kind of politician, when actually he had the strengths and the, and the characteristics and the qualities to be a top-level politician. And, of course, he'll be remembered for that period during the, the aftermath of the global financial crisis, when that was as testing a time for any chancellor, any leader in our lifetime. So do you think and that he's he like... absolutely rose to it. Do you think that he's one of the very, very few MPs who didn't fancy himself as leader then? I think most... That's a very good question. I, I, think, he, I think he... Look, I think if it had come along, I think he, he would have done it and he could have done it. But I think he looked... He wasn't somebody who looked at other people and wanted them not to do well. I think he looked at people like Tony Blair when he was leader of the Labour Party in opposition and, and thought, thank God we've got him there doing what he's doing and I'm going to do what I do. I don't think he was... That's what I mean about him being a team player. I don't think he spent any time sort of sitting around worrying and plotting his next move. And that is quite a rare thing. That is quite a rare thing in politics. And I think it's what makes people feel that incredible sense of integrity that he had. He was genuinely there for public service. His job was to serve the public. He was a Labour MP. He became a Labour minister. And when the Prime Minister, first Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown, asked him to do job A, job B, job C, job D, right up to Chancellor, he just did them to the best of his ability, which is as good as anybody you could have put there. Well, let's bring in our guests, the campaigner and former government advisor Nimco Ali and Sonia Soda, columnist and chief leader writer at The Observer. Good to have you here. It's difficult, isn't it? Because when people die, it's obvious that people are going to say nice things about them mm. in kind words and, and bring back memories. But I felt like when Arthur Darling was alive mm. as well, no one had a bad word to mm. say about him then either. He just had this reputation, I think, in Westminster, right across the piece, mm. for just being someone incredibly decent, committed to public service. He's achieved some really important things in public life. There's, of course, a financial crisis, the bailout of the banks that's considered to have saved the global economy, not just the UK economy. And then the really pivotal role that Ruth Davidson was talking about mm. in terms of the role he played in the 2014 campaign to keep the union together. So I just think he's regarded as somebody who's decent, committed to public service, but who also had a really, you know, if you speak to people who worked for him at the yeah. time, he also kind of was wickedly funny, yeah. had a really dry sense of humour, as you you were saying with yeah, your little yeah, anecdote funny. About, funny. about the yeah. gardener. And, you know, it was fun to spend time with. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he, I think he was a giant of British political life and is going to be very much missed. Yeah. I was yeah. really shocked when I heard the news. No, it is really sad because the 70 is quite young yeah. in, in, in the whole kind of grand scheme of things. But I think ultimately, again, I've never met him, but um, the, the, the fact that Ruth spoke so mm -hmm. well about him so lengthily, I think that kind of shows how he kind of, like, you know, was respected across the, bo um, mm -hmm. across the board. And I think that also came out in the tributes from the current government ministers who you would think would not be celebrating a Labour MP, but were actually sharing personal stories of how they work together. 
Yeah, it's definitely right. You did have that kind of cross-party yeah. sort of mm -hmm. feeling. And it was really interesting. I thought Jeremy Hunt, when he paid tribute mm. on, on Twitter, he thanked Alistair Darling for the, for the right decisions he'd mm, made yeah. at a time of crisis. And that's actually quite unusual mm. coming from a Conservative Chancellor relating to that period in 2008. So I think it, it does just show how respected he was um, across the spectrum. Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? Yeah. And thanks very much for sort of sharing your kind of memories of him and also, like you say, kind of reflecting on what is certainly the case across Westminster. Um, it does feel that, I guess, like you said, like a kind of giant of politics has been lost today. Now to the COVID inquiry. Um, it's been the punch bag for others at the COVID inquiry so far, but today, finally, Matt Hancock was given the chance to have his say. He defended his record as health secretary, describing a toxic culture and deep unpleasantness at the heart of government during the pandemic, but admitted that lockdown should have come earlier. Our political editor, Beth... A discredited former health secretary, accused of incompetence, dishonesty and ultimately being responsible for the death of thousands. Do you like your way through COVID, Mr Hancock? Arriving at the COVID inquiry today to defend his record, his reputation and remonstrate with his critics. The truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Matt Hancock has been heavily criticised for his handling of COVID and accused of misleading the Cabinet about the plans in place to deal with the pandemic. Today, attempting to recast himself as the driving force trying to curtail COVID in early 2020. We were trying to effectively raise the alarm. Um, we were trying to wake up Whitehall to the scale of the problem. Um, and this wasn't a problem that couldn't be addressed only from the health department. The former health secretary also claimed he urged the PM to lock the country down on March 13th, 10 days before the first lockdown began, but he failed to provide a shred of evidence. In that email on the 13th of March, to which you wish us to have regard, do you use the word immediate or lockdown? Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Do you use the word immediate or lockdown? I, I don't have it in front of me. Accusations of dishonesty have plagued Mr Hancock throughout this inquiry. Mr Cummings, Sir Patrick Vallance in his diaries, uh, Helen McNamara have made reference to you lying. I was not. You will note that there's no evidence from anybody who I worked with in the department or the health system who supported that. Uh, those false allegations. Denying he lied, Mr Hancock instead sought to shift blame onto a toxic number 10. I think, unfortunately, the lesson for the future is systems need to be in place so that if there is a malign actor in, in number 10... Do you mean Mr Cummings? Well, in this case, that was the example, but there may be in the future. But if there are people whose... Um, behaviour is, uh, is unprofessional. The system needs to be able to work uh, despite that. Outside bereaved families clear who they blame. It's especially difficult for me to hear the testimony of Matt Hancock. It was under his watch that my husband died. He was in charge of the care homes. He was dead because of the inadequacies of the health secretary. So my feelings toward him are not warm. <laughs> For the families who lost loved ones, not much closure to be found in Matt Hancock's account. This, a day that's raised more questions than it answered. Yeah. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. Well, our health correspondent Ashish Joshi was watching as well today. He joins us now. We've had some days now of the COVID inquiry. Did we learn anything new today? We perhaps learned that for the first time, I think, I've heard Matt Hancock talk about the care homes, widely regarded as probably the biggest scandal through the pandemic, the allowing of untested patients to be discharged from hospitals into care homes for this virus to rip through that sector and claim so many lives. Matt Hancock has never had to answer that directly. Today, under oath, he was asked about this ring of steel, this... this expression he used uh, during his press conferences, he's promised to the Prime Minister that the ring of steel was in place. There seems some doubt to that now when you looked at the WhatsApp messages about the assurances he'd made. But certainly there was a, an admission from him today that perhaps that ring of steel 
wasn't quite that protective ring wasn't quite a ring because uh, Hugo Keith Casey said, well, according to Professor uh, Jonathan Van Tam, a ring is completely closed. There's no way in, no way out. So if you take that uh, to be a ring, would you say you place that ring around a care home? And he looked down and he said, no, in that mm. case, I'd agree with Professor Van Tam. So therefore, there were some protections in place, but certainly not the, the protection that he'd been telling the country about. And we also learned, again, Beth referenced it there in her report, that he was urging, or he says he was urging the Prime Minister to lock down much earlier, on March the 10th, uh, no, 13th, 10 days before the actual first lockdown. No evidence to support that claim. And then he says that he was um, urging the Prime Minister uh, to take further action, claims he's made in his book, and he was asked about the evidence to support those claims, none there as well. And he also talked about asymptomatic claims, suggesting that he thought because of the anecdotal evidence that had been presented to him and his colleagues, that he had learned that COVID-19 was possible through asymptomatic transmission. Before the scientists, he said, I knew it and I wanted to go with that, but I had to listen to my scientists. And that's my one biggest regret of the pandemic. And he writes about that in his book as well. And of course, with Matt Hancock, there is no uh, chain of, of evidence to support that claim. There you go. His one regret is knowing more than the scientists and not sticking to his guns. Interesting. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ashish uh, Joshi. Still to come on The Politics Hub. We'll get more reaction from our duo for tonight. We'll also tell you the latest on the future of The Telegraph. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. My most memorable story was, and still is, the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Please, please do not hurt her. Please give our little girl back. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. For detectives, the first 48 hours after a murder are crucial in the search for clues. The public expects them to find Jill Dando's killer soon. The British detectives are planning to meet forensic experts, academics and even witch doctors. I remember the grimmest case, the Soham murders of schoolgirls Holly and Jessica. I felt I can't undo what's happened, but I can help explain it. Ian Huntley was arrested and charged within a fortnight of the murders. I've never murdered anyone. I've never raped anyone. What am I in jail for? The parole board has to decide if Bronson needs to be kept locked up for the safety of the public. My biggest challenge was to persuade a jail diamond thief to answer my letters. Martin Brunt, Sky News at the Old Bailey. that way behind the desk. Now, it's been the story bubbling around Westminster over the last couple of weeks, but today Sky News has learned that the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, is going to launch a probe into the takeover of the Daily Telegraph by a state-backed Abu Dhabi-based fund. Well, our business correspondent, Paul Kelso, has the latest. What's happening there? Yeah, so Lucy Fraser said Culture Secretary has launched what's called the Public Interest Intervention notice, which is essentially a good look. You can do it on business deals about whether it's appropriate for the takeover of the Telegraph by an American-fronted but Abu Dhabi-backed 
consortium. It's a bit of a saga, the Telegraph, how we got here, so why don't we walk through the process. This is the Barclay brothers, the late Sir David and uh, Sir Frederick, who bought the Telegraph titles back in 2004, three of them, the Daily and Sunday Telegraph and the Spectator, the weekly magazine. Now, in the process of buying them in the preceding years, those titles became security against loans, £1.16 billion that the brothers and the family took out, unbeknownst to the editorial staff at The Telegraph and anybody else, that ultimately is now owned to Lloyds Bank. Now, the bank took a really unusual step back in June. They tipped the holding company into administration, took control, effectively, of the titles and said, we want to sell these to try and recoup some of the money. And there's been an auction ongoing, some big players in British newspapers and international media interested. But out of the blue, two weeks ago, international media investments, that's owned by the Abu Dhabi ruling family, Sheikh, Maktou, uh, Sheikh Mansour, forgive me, and Redbird Capital Partners, which is a US fund that they back, came up with a bid. It's these people. Jeff Zucker, who used to run CNN, and Sheikh Mansour, owns Manchester City, plenty of people will know them, um, came up with an offer. £1.16 billion, pounds, completely repay Lloyds and ultimately take control of the titles. There's a bit of other uh, Barclay family companies in there as security. What's being examined now is on... Ofcom will look whether on media grounds, whether on media freedom and potential censorship and suppression of media freedom, is this OK? And the Competition and Markets Authority will look at whether the deal stacks up. So, effectively, this whole corporate structure looks a bit messy. It still is. It's in limbo while the government effectively decides whether these guys are fit to own these newspapers. Um... I mean, it's a big, big media story, but it's a big political story as well here in Westminster. I mean, The Telegraph has big influence in Tory circles too. Yeah, it's really interesting. It's a heritage brand. We thought newspapers were dead. Well, clearly not. Potentially 600 million is the, the, the number that's put on the value of these titles. There are other big players. Rupert Murdoch's interest in The Spectator. The owners of The Daily Mail are interested. Um, it's Paul Marshall, who owns GB News, he's interested. The fact is, they're all being... They're interested because of the clout and leverage it has within the Tory party. The mm. Telegraph speaks to the Tory membership. The Spectator is the ideas, home of ideas in the Conservative. I spoke to former Chairman Brandon Lewis today, who actually thinks it's OK for this deal to go through, unlike many of his colleagues. And he said the reason is the Telegraph simply is at the heart of the party. There's no doubt the Telegraph has an absolute... sits in the heartbeat of many, many Conservative members and supporters across the country, but I think it's bigger than that. The Telegraph is one of the real substantive newspapers of the United Kingdom, with a long history that's respected around the world. The Spectator, has got, as well, has got a phenomenal history and a great reputation around the world. They're kind of some of those iconic titles that it makes the UK media so popular around the world. Thanks very much, Paul. I have a feeling we're going to have more updates on this story uh, from you uh, in the coming weeks. Thanks very much. Uh, well, let's have a chat to Nimco and uh, Sonia, shall we? Uh, lots of issues uh, there about the uh, Telegraph. Nimco, how are we talk about the importance to the Conservative Party of the Telegraph? Yeah, I think the, like, you know, the Telegraph and the Spectator are very much, like, you know, aligned with the, where, where the Conservative Party. But I think what's really interesting is the hot take of the fact that we're going to Middle Eastern um, buyers. I think we're having this conversation of, like, are they worthy of buying? But I would rather um, our Middle Eastern owners than somebody that's going to turn it into um, into GGV News. So I think the, the, and the whole point is, if someone like Brandon Lewis says it's okay for them to own it, then I think it's a okay idea. I mean, I think it was absolutely the right decision for this to get referred to the CMA and to Ofcom, because at the end of the day, who owns you know one of our sort of five national newspapers or whatever it is? I should know that off the top of my head, but in this country. That's a key bit of our news infrastructure. And, you know, there are all kinds of other areas of the economy that are very strategic and important. So, for example, energy infrastructure, mm -hmm. um, communications infrastructure. We had a big debate, didn't we, about Huawei, uh, you know, a part state-owned uh, tech company by China, whether they should uh, be able to buy part, you know, how much involvement they should have in our, 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 our comms infrastructure. So I do think that there are extremely legitimate questions because this is a, you know, this is a state, um, you know, the United Arab Emirates, who would own a significant part of, you know, a key part of our information landscape. So I think it's really right that we've got regulators probing these questions. How do we work out, you know, what we're happy with 
foreign investors buying and what we're not happy. I mean, we, we, the reference to Man City, for example. Yeah, I, I was going to say... It's very normal. Exactly, I was going to say that's the level of influence that they have. And I think that the, that the way a v, um, like, a, like an investment company buys something in is I don't think that they're, they're going to have editorial control. So if the conversation was the fact that these um, these Middle Eastern buys were going to come in and, pop, and, and, and put in their own editors and kind of change the narrative of the story, I think that's a different thing. But ultimately, in order for them to be able to buy something, they they wanted to make money, so I don't necessarily think that there would be that much um, amount of change. And with with um, Chinese-backed technology, I think that's completely different because that's a, a hostile country um, to the UK. So I don't necessarily think... We have to have a conversation about the reasons why people are buying this, and I think they're buying it to make money. And in order to do that, I don't think they're going to change the ethics of the, of the paper. But, but newspaper owners, they do get a significant say. They do have influence. We know that, for example, if we look at the Murdoch empire. You know, Rupert Murdoch has personal influence over the editorial direction of its newspapers. And, you know, you would expect that in many ways because he owns them. Uh, well, and to be so... fair, I guess, to the Murdoch papers, you know, they switch alliance, right? They exactly. Yeah. Whoever yeah. they think is going to win the yeah. election. Yeah, but, but, I, I, but, but, uh, but I do think that owners have influence over the editorial directions of newspapers and therefore it is right to ask questions about who's allowed to buy them. Um, newspapers not dead, though. Must be good news for you. Yes, yeah, <laughs> well, thankfully, yeah, exactly. I think that's true. No, no, no we're a long way from uh, that. And I think particularly if you look at the circulation of weekend papers, for example, people still... You know, people were predicting the end of print newspapers sort of 10, 12 years ago. And it is true that, you know, people do consume information online a lot more now. But actually, at the weekend, you know... You do want to pick up from my yeah, paper. Yeah. But, but, you know, on a Sunday or a Saturday, it's really nice to sit there with the papers and all the supplements and, you know, not just read the news, but read the style section too, so the magazines, so, yeah. yeah. I remember people were saying newspapers were dying many, many years ago when I was I doing they... my national uh, training of yeah. uh, paper journalist um, qualification. Uh, so, yeah, it's absolutely right. No, no, I was just going to I think that's a consistent thing that's said, but I think the ge that generation are changing it. It's the fact that everybody just wants a break from the internet once in a while yeah. Yeah. and getting a newspaper is the thing to do. Uh, there you go. Thank you both very much, um, Nimco and Sonia. Coming up next on The Politics Hub. Amidst frantic diplomatic negotiations to extend the ceasefire in Gaza and release more hostages, I speak to the mother who is pleading with the authorities in Israel and Hamas to give her proof that her son is alive.
Hello, welcome back. Israel says two more hostages have been released as part of what was their last-minute extension to the ceasefire with Hamas. But even as the daily trickle of releases continue for some families, the need is for something more basic, proof that their loved ones are still alive. I've been speaking to Oret Mir, whose 21-year-old son, Almog, was abducted amid scenes of horror at the Nova Music Festival on the 7th of October. Her brother was beside her for support. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, the fact you're here shows so much strength, and I know you're here to talk about your son, Almog. We can see him there smiling. Talk to me about him. What's he like? My son, Almog, is 21 years old. You see his smile. <laughs> smile all the time. He takes life easy. He's a very, very happy guy with lots of energy, full of values, sensitive. And he has, he's friendly. He has lots of friends. You can see his smile beaming out through that picture. Yeah. What kind of thing makes him smile like that? What does he enjoy? He's so energetic mm. that uh, usually he goes, uh, he, makes, he makes sports, he goes to parties, he, he loves music, all kinds, he went to concerts. Mm. Uh, Everything that makes me, that makes him uh, move, he, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we know you've got your, your brothers here supporting you. Yeah. It's, I know how difficult it must be, of course, for you to, to talk about your son and, and to make everyone know who he is, why it's so important for him to come home to you. He's got an older sister as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has a sister. Mm -hmm. I have a daughter. She's 31 years old. And she got married. I have a granddaughter. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And on October the 6th, Almog was with his grandparents, is that right? Is he helping his grandfather? He was helping before and after mm. he went to the party, mm. yes. And then he went to the music festival? Yes. He went, uh, his friend Tomer came, uh, came before and they went together to the festival. Mm. I asked him uh, where is the party and he says it's in the south mm. of Israel. Uh, I asked him where is exactly, so he said it's uh, in uh, Kibbutz uh, Reim. Reim. So he said Kibbutz uh, Reim is very close to Gaza. Mm. So he said, so what? Mm. Uh, they got a permission from the army, from the kibbutzim around. Uh, so what? He used to go to the south, mm. to everywhere. He loved dancing. He loved music. So he went to lots of parties. Mm. He's 21. Yes, <laughs> he's young. <laughs> mm. When did you first realise something was wrong? After his phone call, he called me in the morning at the 7th of October. He called me at 7.45 a.m. Mm. And he said to me, Mom, they closed the festival. There are rockets <laughs> and shooting everywhere. I don't know what is going on. I'm hiding. <laughs> I'll call you every half, hour, every half an hour. Mom, I love you. This was the last call from him. And after, when I opened TV, I saw all the tragedy that happened there. And I realized he is in danger. My son usually don't uh, 
don't talk to me like this. Mm. I love you. You don't say it at the telephone, mm. usually. So I published this uh, picture in the Facebook, and we asked a question. Who saw Almog? He went to Nova Festival. Mm. After three hours, I got a phone call from a friend who recognized him from a video that the Hamas published in the Telegram. And when I saw the video, my life, it's, you know, it, it was like a knife in my stomach. He was lying there on the floor with four other young guys. They were tight on, a, on their hands. Some of them were beaten. My son was lying on the floor. He covered his, hair, his face with his hand and he was looking frightened, frightened. I start to shout. I understood that now my life is going to change. Nothing will be the same. Nothing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Your brother's left, you need him, okay? Can I? I'll drink water. Of course, take some. <sighs> Thank you. Do you know anything about what happened on the, on the day, who he was with, if he was taken with anyone that he knew? Yes. Yeah. Actually, Tomer, his friend, the friend he went with him to the party, to the festival. Yeah. He came to my, to our house a few times, mm -hmm. but uh, I didn't have uh, any contact with his parents. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I got the number somehow, and uh, I understood that Tomer, his friend, called his parents, mm. so I got information. My son uh, and Tomer, his friend, decided to, they, ha they were hiding, and after they decided to go to the car, uh, to escape. To escape. Uh, two other sisters, Two sisters came to the car with them. They knew them before. They met them in the festival, and they tried to escape with the, by car. But after a few meters, uh, uh, they pumped the, the, the car, and they escaped from the car. They started to run to different direction. Uh, the two sisters uh, start to run together, they to escape together. Their father called them and uh, he stayed with them for one and a half hour while they are running. And um, after they decided to, to lie on the floor to, uh, like, like they, they are dead. To pretend to be dead. To pretend they are dead. And, but they were murdered. The father heard it. The two girls were murdered. While, while he kissed, he heard it, and even the last breath. Thomas went to another direction, you know, then Almog, and Thomas were, Murdered well, two. They took them two weeks to identify his body because they burned 
the body after the murder. And my son, my son is the only one who uh, was alive and he was kidnapped. They're just kids at a festival. Yeah. You want to celebrate. Mm. You know that on the, he was supposed to start a new job mm. in, a, in ITEC that he was looking forward. And, and I know that they, they wait for him mm. till he will come back to start his new job. We'll all be praying that he gets to go and do that. We've seen some hostages be released. How has that been for you when you know that your son is still there? First of all, I'm, I'm happy for the families for, and for the hostages to come, that they'll come back, came back. Yeah, but from the other end, you know, I'm jealous. Mm. I want my son to uh, come home too. And uh, till now they release a uh, woman and children. And uh, yesterday they released uh, two young women from uh, Yesterday or today, they're supposed to... Today. Today. Mia. Yes. Today they're supposed to... Uh, I know that two uh, young women, mm. uh, they're on a release. They... From the festival. From the, the festival. From, oh, the festival. Went... From the festival, oh. yes. Yeah. It's a... Uh, you know, I want... I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. My wait until he will come. If and when you get your son home, what do you want to do? I have lots of ideas. And of course we are going to celebrate. Mm. But since I don't see my son, I don't want to play in anything. Mm -hmm. I just want to see him, to hug him, and to see his situation. I'm worried that they don't eat, because the hostages went out and came home. They lost in about 15 kilograms from their weight, and I'm worried. I want to see him first. And after we think about how to celebrate. Thank you. Your story and your strength will always stay with me. And you've been a wonderful advocate for your son. I think everyone watching this will have a real sense of the kind of man he is. And he's done obviously some, he does you very proud, but you do him very proud as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's talk to Nimco and Sonia, shall we? It's, I don't really know what to say, to be honest. It's just the, the stories from the conflict that we've seen mm. in October the 7th, is just, it's just beyond words. It's got wrenching. I think that's the kind of um, way to describe it. And Sonia and I were talking about the march um, last week, and I think one of the things that's really stood out in this mother that is begging for the return of her son is I think the lack of compassion that, that we're showing to not, not just the victims that passed away, but the victims that are waiting for their children to be returned. So I think I'm, I'm hoping the way that you did this interview was to, in order to be able to humanize the people who are waiting for their um, children to be released.
And it's just, I mean, obviously we've seen some images of joy as parents yeah. have been reunited with children, although it has a very bitter sting. So Emily Hans, you know, the Irish Israeli girl, the, nine, the girl who turned nine in Hamas captivity, her father has spoken out and gave interviews about how, you know, Hamas threatened her with silence for 50 days. She's so traumatised that he had to put his ear to her lips to be able to hear what she's yeah. saying and she just, you know is clearly traumatised and cries herself to sleep every night. So it's, you know, there's so much that these families are going to have to go through, even when their children are returned. And then to listen to that interview with that, that mum, and of yeah. course, she's got an adult son, you know, he's yeah. 21, and, and the men are not being returned yet, and there are still children. And then we've heard about the baby hostages, nine months and three, year old, three years old, who died today. It's just... It's, it's very hard to process this, I think. Um, I, I think the point you make is... It's true, we, we've seen young children, we've seen women and then the elderly being returned and, you know, this, this boy, and he is a boy, he's only 21, he's, he's, only, at a, he's yeah. only at a music festival. Yeah, exactly. yeah. But we, we don't know, do we? And I think that's the difference, I think, is the fact that we're having this conversation as though there's some kind of war where actually they're being held hostage by a terrorist organisation. I think that's the complete difference to it and the, the fact that who's, the, who's deciding who are, who are adults or not, but it's just her child. And I think that's the conversation yeah. that we're um, missing and, I, and that's what I meant about the humanising of these yeah. um, pictures and names is the fact that they do have parents and families that are waiting for them, yeah. that are living in anguish every day. Yeah, she's just an ordinary woman. Probably never mm. been in a TV studio in her life. She just wants her son to of come home. Yeah. And I thought that, you know, I kind of asked her that last question saying, if or when he comes home, what do you want to do? And she was like, I'm, I can't think about that. Mm. And I was like, actually, it's sort of like I you really can't, get that. Yeah, I yeah. can imagine that she can't yeah. just allow herself to think about that, you know. Yeah, totally. totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you both uh, very much indeed, Nimco and Sonia there. More to come with our guests tonight, next on The Politics Hub. I heard the fire alarms go off and uh, one of the guys, the banksman on the ground said uh, this, is, this is not a fire drill, this is evacuate everyone out and uh, there's a fire on level 8. Um, I was concreting at the time and I, I looked out my left window and I could see the smoke so I, I just hoisted up and slewed round to get put the uh, concrete skip on the ground mm -hmm. um, and uh, they said, yeah, you have to come out the crane as well. So um, I, I started, I got the skip off and my chains and I started hoisting up and I slew back round and I looked out my left window. And as I looked out my left window, um, one of the guys on the ground shouted out, there's a guy on level eight. Um, and I, I stopped what I was doing and I looked out on level eight where he was and he was waving his coat. And you could see the area where he was standing. You knew he yeah. didn't have that much space. No, he had about two metres. He was standing about two square metres there. Uh, that wasn't a light. So um, when I touched down the cage, there was materials on the floor. So the cage started to tilt a little bit. Um, yeah, and uh, the wind caught the block then. And it started pulling the cage over. And I thought, no, lucky it came back. And um, then I heard the, heard the cage go down and then the banksman said, he's in, he's in. So, um, and, I, and then I heard the crowd outside, they, all, they were all shouting as well, I could hear all that as well. So, um, yeah, and then up and away, back, pulled the lever right back as fast as I could, get him out of there. You are in the right place at the right time in terms yeah, of you were yeah. in your cab. You yeah. were told to evacuate him, but yeah. you heard that someone yeah. was there, so you stayed in. And like you said, you've done that manoeuvre yeah, yeah. many, many times. Yeah, I've been, I've been on that level before, yeah. But from what you're saying, you were operating blind. You yeah. and oh, your man on the ground yeah. worked together. Yeah. What was that like? What were the nerves like? Uh, the adrenaline in was out the roof. Like the, I, I can't tell you. I, you know, when I... When I Got him back on the ground, put him back on the ground safely, and and the uh, ambulance staff was there. Um, yeah, they they got took him away, and they took my hooks off, and I blocked up and everything, got the crane safe, and I just stood up, and my you know I, I was shaky as hell. Hello, welcome back. Well, it's not been a great week for the prime minister, but he did at least have the chance to spread some Christmas cheer this evening, turning on the lights on the tree at Downing Street.
As Prime Minister, I've got to say, it's, it would be very nice if sometimes you could just flick a button and everything would turn out to be brighter. It's one of the rare chances I am going to get to do that. So please join me in the countdown. Are you ready? All right, here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. There you go. That was the big moment. I mean, they are quite amazing, the Downing Street Christmas trees. Yeah, they, they are, are yeah. enormous. I've done a lot of lives outside them, and they are they are pretty pretty bumper. It feels it feels a little bit early still, though. What do you think? No, I've oh. really got my Christmas tree up. You've got yours yeah, up? Yeah, I have one up for a full week. Yeah. See, I haven't got mine up. I'm waiting for my niece to turn up this um, this weekend. But I think everybody's going to have theirs this when weekend. When do you put yours up? No, Is you a late adopter? No, this weekend. Okay. Not that late. Don't get me wrong. Exactly. Saturday morning, I'll be straight out getting the Christmas tree <laughs> okay. on. But it's got to be December, hasn't it? No, I think there's an increasing <laughs> trend towards because I've got a fake tree as well. So I mean, it lasts forever. So you don't need to think about it. You know, drop, put, needles dropping off. I think off the thing about the bonfire so. nights, you can start celebrating. I think Christmassy, but yeah. I think but yeah. So like October's for Halloween. Then then we have firework nights, and then we. I'm a big fan work. of Christmas tree up last week November. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And and because yeah, we don't have Thanksgiving, that's why. So we can do Christmas that's trees. Fair. Up, yeah. What, what's your take on Christmas decorations? Um, should I mean, they be like loud, brash, you know, yes. kids like rubbish that they've made, or should yes. it be like, you know, perfectly all colour no. themed? See, my niece no. has spent like the last two and a half years in Dubai, so she's coming back with like she wants a theme this year. But before it was like t just like tacky um, tinsel and those little like, you know, angels that she made out of toilet paper rolls and all those other kind of cool things. I quite like that because, That's what Christmas because is I don't about, really celebrate Christmas, it? I just do Slightly it for the Christmas decorations cultural... that are made by Slightly kids. Crap, yeah. I love it. I love it. I mean, I'm, I'm for that too. <laughs> yeah. Now, right, we haven't got a tree in here yet. It's a bit early, I think, although Sonia disagrees. Uh, but we did want to have our own switch on still. Now, I have no idea how this is going to go, just to warn you. So the technical team here have told me it is still possible with the magic of technology. So let's see what they've come up with, OK? Right, I need to count down. OK. Right, five, four, four three, three, two, one. one. Let's go. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> anyway, that's see you tomorrow. Nice.